morning, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the Quantum Spain Seminar. Today, we have the pleasure to have our invited guest, Roman Oroz, and he is a hypervascular research professor at the Donostia International Physics Center in San Sebastián, Spain, as well as the co-founder and chief scientific officer of the Multiverse Computing. Let's welcome Roman, and uh, he will talk about simulating IBM secret icing experiment with quantum spikes and thunder. Thank you. Okay. okay, so thanks a lot. Let's get started. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure to give a seminar in this in this series of seminars of, of Quantum Spain, which, as you know, this is an initiative that, I, uh, that I've been uh, supporting for quite a while already. OK, so this is this is particularly good. So thanks a lot for the invitation. Well, today um, I'm going to be talking about a paper that uh, we released, I think it was um, a couple of months ago, more or less. I think it was in September. OK. And it was about the simulation of uh, an experiment that was done uh, by IBM on their quantum processors. Uh, I will explain afterwards the context, but essentially it's about an experiment that IBM did uh, in their Eagle quantum processor with 127 qubits, okay, where they simulated the dynamics of a quantumizing model with a transverse field. Okay. Um, and then they computed a series of, of observables. Okay. So um, there were a series of claims in the results uh, from IBM that were a little bit controversial, and what we did was to actually simulate experiments uh, with tensor networks, okay? As you will see from my talk, uh, when one talks about tensor networks, one has to be very careful, okay? Um, tensor networks are um, is a very broad field, okay? Uh, and there are many methods and techniques that one can apply, and before jumping on making any claims of advantage and so on, one really needs to be very careful about, uh, to, you know, to be sure that one is actually using the correct tensor network method to simulate the system or not. Okay, you will see exactly what I mean from this talk. Okay, let me move on. Um, this is um, the experiment that I was talking about. So I think it was in June 2023, not so long ago, that IBM uh, made it to the news, okay, with uh, with a paper, okay, they had this paper evidence for the utility of quantum computing before fault tolerance. This is a great paper, okay, disclaimer, I mean, I, I, I really like it. Um, they did uh, some some amazing things, in particular, they, they showed how, uh, without quantum error correction, they showed how to apply error mitigation techniques, okay, uh, to remove the error from the calculations and extrapolate to the correct results in order to be able to, you know, get the correct uh, dynamics of a, of a quantum many body system. Okay. They published this, as I said, in June 2023 uh, with unprecedented error mitigation techniques. They did it on the quantum processor with 127 qubits and they made a lot of noise. They made it to the cover of nature. Okay. Um, you know, cutting through noise. Uh, they started to claim that there was a new era of quantum utility. Okay. Where quantum computers can compute things that classical methods can reach. Okay, we'll discuss that later, whether that's true or not. Okay, and um, and they also made it to the news. There was a lot of noise. This is a great paper on the quantum side. I mean, <clears throat> concerning the error mitigation techniques, it's really amazing what they did. This is the machine that they use. Okay, it's the IBM Eagle quantum processor. Okay, with 127 qubits. As you know, IBM has more than 127 qubits right now. Um, they have, I think, an Osprey processor with 433, and they are supposed to announce in December the one with, um, I think it's called Condor, with 1,121 qubits, okay? But probably they use 127 qubits because this is the one that they, they control better, okay? This is, by the way, this is the same type of machine that we are going to get installed in San Sebastian um, here, where IBM is going to be building also a quantum center. We will get exactly this machine with 127 qubits. That's the range of the qubits. This is a quantum computer that is based on uh, superconducting qubits, okay? Um, superconducting qubit technology uh, in the same way as other quantum processors, okay, such as Rigetti, Google, and so on. Um, and obviously, when you have artificial qubits, as is in this case, right? Um, artificial, I mean that you have to build the qubit uh, based on a quantum two-level system that is not natural, as is in this case, it's just a superconducting currents. You have to place that on a lattice. 
Okay, you have to build the interactions according to a topology of interactions, kind of artificially. Now, the simplest thing of building a lattice is to think about a two-dimensional lattice, as uh, I think that all the uh, or most of the providers of uh, superconducting quantum processors are doing. And this is the type of lattice that IBM is doing. Okay, uh, in particular, this is the lattice for 127 lattice, uh, qubits. Uh, it's called a heavy hexagon lattice. Okay, it's like a honeycomb lattice. Um, distorted, okay, so it looks more like a brick wall lattice where you are actually adding some extra nodes, okay, in the links apart than, than the vertices. You realize that this is a, an interesting lattice, actually. All the nodes here have connectivity either two or three, so it has a very low connectivity. Later on, we'll discuss about what are the implications of this, but obviously, with this low connectivity, you can already build a two-dimensional system and you can start doing non-trivial things. Uh, and it's good that it has very low connectivity because it's then very easy to build, okay? If we had to build a quantum computer on a square lattice, the connectivity will be higher and then it may be technologically more complicated. So this is a good option a priori to, to start building things uh, with a quantum processor. What did they do in the experiment? Well, they simulated the dynamics of this Hamiltonian. It's a spin one half transverse field icing model on a heavy hexagon lattice. They essentially place uh, one spin on every node of the lattice, okay, which corresponds to one qubit. And this is the Hamiltonian of the system. We have uh, ZZ, ferromagnetic ZZ interactions, okay, uh, between nearest neighbors on the lattice, right? And then they add an extra external uh, transverse magnetic field in the X direction, okay? Now, this is a typical modeling on this matter. It's the Ising model with a transverse field, and they just simulate it on, the, on this heavy hexagon lattice. And what they do is they do the dynamics of the system. They start from initial from some initial state and do the time evolution. Okay. Now, when doing the time evolution, they have to split the time evolution operator into, you know, into different pieces uh, with a trotter error. Okay, this is what it's called trotterization in order to build a quantum circuit to simulate the system. And this is what they did um, in this, in this, you know, in this figure, okay, right here on the on the upper left corner, uh, each step for them is essentially four layers of gates, one layer of one body gates, which correspond to rotations in the x direction that come from the magnetic field in the x direction, and then three layers of two body gates, okay, that correspond to you know two body gates coming from the interactions, okay. These three layers, they are mutually commuting, okay? Sorry, all the gates inside of each one of the layers are mutually commuting. The layers don't commute with each other, but then there is an associated trotter error. And you can see that the red layer is acting on the red links, the blue layer is acting on the blue links, and the green layer is acting on the green links, okay? So far, I mean, there is nothing uh, magic about this. It's just a way of breaking the time evolution into, into different trotter steps. So they simulate this for a number of steps, and at the end they measure and they compute a series of observables, all right? That's exactly what they do. Well, these are examples of the results that they got. Um, they computed different observables. This is just an example of some of the plots that they were showing. Uh, magnetization, uh, a total average magnetization in the Z direction, for instance, uh, as a function of an angle, okay, that I will explain later what this angle means. It's actually one of the parameters in the system. It's, it has to do with the magnetic field, okay? Um, also, expectation values of um, non-local observables, okay? X, Y, and Z in different sides of the system and see how this, you know, how this changes in time and so on. And they do different comparisons. Obviously, you can see uh, the results for the quantum processors without error mitigation, which are way off, okay? The quantum processor with error mitigation, Okay, which is different. And then they have some exact calculation or quasi exact using a method that I will not explain here that actually matches, you know, the numbers from or matches pretty well the numbers from the uh, that were obtained with the error mitigation. Then they compare this with calculations using uh, tensor networks. And in particular, they use two types of tensor network techniques. They use um, a technique based on matrix protostates that I will explain later what this is, and another technique based on something called isometric tensor network states. And this, you know, these methods, uh, they were actually way off. The results were were actually pretty catastrophic, and you can see that for matrix protostates, which is this, this pink thing, I mean, it was actually not working. And for isometric tensor network states, which is a type of tensor network in two dimensions, it was also not working, okay? Now, after seeing this, um, IBM, jump to the conclusions that uh, their, their error mitigation techniques 
were beyond what was able one was able to obtain using pure state-based tensor network methods. Okay. And they were also claiming that they have reached their reliability at the scale, which can provide utility beyond classical approximation methods. Well, what I want to explain in this talk is that this is this is relative. Okay, uh, this is relative. IBM, the problem that they had is that they, they chose the ground tensor network method to simulate this system. Okay, um, it's not these methods that they were using. They were not methods that were adapted to simulate this lattice, and obviously this was way wrong. Okay, and as you will see. Um, there are some uh, implications of this, and one should be careful about what type of claims one should be doing. That's the question. What happens if we use other two-dimensional tensor network algorithms? Okay. Well, let's start. Let's start talking about tensor networks because uh, I want to put everybody on on the same ground. Okay. Um, what is this story about about tensor networks and where do they come from? Um, everything comes from the uh, from noticing that the Hilbert space, as Frank Verstreit said one day, Hilbert space is a convenient illusion. Okay, you know it's a mathematical description of a quantum many-body system that is very very convenient. Okay, and it's actually the correct description. But if we want to describe flow energy states of matter, this is too much. This is too much. Okay. Now, what does it mean? Well, imagine that uh, that the Hilbert space of a quantum many-body system is, you know, like this set that I have here in blue. Okay, this is a huge space. We have exponentially many states uh, living living here. Now, if I want to represent here the set of uh, let's say product states that have no entanglement, uh, this is an exponentially small corner of the Hilbert space. All right, these are the states that are totally corresponding to to approximations such as the mean field approximation in condensed matter physics. No. Now, the situation is even worse. So people have proven with theorems that the set of uh, ground states of local Hamiltonians, okay, ground states of Hamiltonians with local interactions, they can be well represented by a family of states that is called tensor network states that I will explain in a second. And this is also an exponentially small corner of the Hilbert space, okay? More than that, the set of states that obey the area law for the entanglement entropy, okay, which is a very well-known property for quantum many-body systems, it's also an exponentially small corner of, of the Hilbert space. This is very critical. It's not just that it's an exponentially small corner of the Hilbert space. It's that these are sets of uh, measure zero, okay, in the sense that when you increase the size of the system, the relative size of the overall Hilbert space grows exponentially fast compared to how these corners are growing. So, so the more sides you add, the more irrelevant this, act this is actually becoming, okay? Now, it turns out that nature at low energies is in this exponentially small corner, okay? And also the dynamics of, uh, of many body systems for, for short times is also in this corner, okay? The situation is even worse because there was a, a theorem from 2011 by David Poulin, from Verstraete, and other collaborators uh, that proved that actually, if you are in this uh, small corner right here and you want to access the rest of the Hilbert space with time evolution, it's going to take you an exponentially an exponential amount of time. So, so exploring the Hilbert space is impractical. It takes an exponential amount of time if you are just doing time evolution with local Hamiltonians. If you just put some numbers, if you have a system that is close to the thermodynamic limit, let's say 10 to the 23 spins. So the exploration time of the Hilbert space is exponential in the sides of the system. It goes like 10 to the 23, 10 to the 10 to the 23 seconds, okay? A double exponential. And now you can compare this to the edge of the universe, which is of the order of 10 to the 17 seconds, okay? This obviously is telling you that we have a problem here, okay? We need, if we want to describe nature at low energies, which is this corner that we have right here, we need a different language. Okay, and this language is precisely tensor networks. We need a formalism that targets directly this exponentially small corner that we have here. This is the set of relevant states in nature. Now, how do we do this? We do this with tensor networks. Now, what are tensor networks? Well, these are these are tensor networks are representations of quantum many body systems in terms of tensors. All right. From now on, every time I'm talking about tensor networks, I'm going to be using a diagrammatic notation that maybe some of you um, are already familiar with. Uh, I'm going to be using this type of notation where tensors are going to be represented by, by balls in this case, and indices in the tensors are going to be represented by lines. All right. And now, uh, you know, every time that there is a line that goes from one tensor to another, it means that this is an index, okay, that is common to both tensors and such that there is a contraction over this index, okay? There is a sum over all the possible range. Now, with this notation, what is this idea of tensor networks? The idea of tensor networks is to pick up the coefficient of the quantum many-body wave function, okay, in some local basis, and replace it 
okay, by a network of interconnected tensors according to some network pattern. Okay, so for instance, this is the tensor for the coefficient, and I'm going to replace it, for instance, by this. Now, this is the first example of a tensor network that we have here. This is called a matrix product state. It's the simple, it's the simplest tensor network that you could think of. It's just a one-dimensional array of tensors, okay? And this is this is extremely popular. This is extremely popular for different reasons, um, mainly because it's very efficient to manipulate. Okay, obviously it's the first thing that one can think of, right? Just a one-D array of tensors. It's extremely efficient to manipulate. There are theorems in computer science and complexity theory that tell you that it's very efficient to compute expectation values and do other type of simulations with uh, with MPS. Okay, but also because there are there are methods, okay, and techniques in condensed matter physics and beyond that are very popular and uh, that are based on on MPS. Okay, the most popular one is the density matrix renormalization group (DMRG). Okay, which was proposed by Steve White in '92, and it's actually it's actually the method that has conquered, let's say, all the physics of one-dimensional systems, okay? It's a variational method over the family of matrix product states. Now, introducing MPS, you can see that in a tensor network, you have different ingredients, okay? You have indices that correspond to the original physical indices that correspond to the original, let's say, local Hilbert spaces, okay? That can go, in this case, for instance, up to dimension P. But then we have to introduce another index right here that is connecting the different tensors in the tensor networks. And this is called the bond index, okay? The bond index. This bond index can go up to a number that typically we call it capital D or chi, okay? It has, the, depending on the paper, you can see it in, in, different, in, in different notations. Uh, but it has an important role because this is the guy that is actually gluing the different tensors together. And one can prove mathematically that this is the responsible for, you know, putting entanglement in the wave function. Okay. Entanglement is codified in part in these bond dimensions that we have here. Okay. So this is a matrix product state. Now in tensor networks, we can go beyond MPS. Um, we can go, for instance, to generalize matrix protest states to higher dimensional systems. And then one has uh, something called projected entangled pair states or PEPs. Um, in some uh, previous references, people also call them uh, tensor product states or TPS. Okay. And this is just the higher dimensional generalization of an MPS. As you can see, uh, PEPs. Um, you know, structural is from the structure point of view is actually quite different from an MPS. An MPS is a 1D array of tensors, uh, and unless it has periodic boundary conditions, it has no loops. In a projected entangled pair state, even if you have open boundary conditions, you are going to have lots of loops, okay? Uh, because it's a 2D structure. And this in practice implies that the algorithms are much more complicated, that the theorems regarding how efficient it is to manipulate these type of structures are very different, and so on and so forth. Still, PEPs have been used since many years ago uh, in the development of very well-known already um, techniques to simulate uh, quantum many-body systems uh, in two and higher dimensions. There are things such as the tensor product variational approach, the PEPs algorithm, the infinite PEPs algorithms, tensor entanglement renormalization, TRG, GPEPs, and so on. Okay, so people have been working on this a lot. It's in red because this is exactly the type of tensor network that we are going to be using uh, for this talk. And here the limit, well, you know, it's it's your creativity. Depending on the type of entanglement uh, that you have in your quantum many-body wave function, the tensor network structure is going to be one or the other. This is another type of example. This is called the multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz, or, or MERA. Uh, it was Gifre Vidal, actually, who invented this because he realized that this is a type of uh, tensor network structure that is at work for critical systems in one dimension. Okay, for critical systems, you have a scale invariance, you have to incorporate it in the entanglement, and actually the tensor network that pops out is this one, where you have the space direction and you have an extra holographic direction that corresponds to a renormalization group scale. Okay, this is very interesting. It's a good description of critical systems. Uh, it's, it also has very interesting links to string theory, actually, to the ADS-CFT correspondence, to the holographic principle, to quantum gravity, and so on, but I will not enter into that. Okay. Now, what is the nice thing about tensor networks? The nice thing is that when doing these, uh, these substitutions, we went from a description of the quantum many-body state that was inefficient, okay, in terms of an array, you know, of many indices, 
to a description of the quantum media body state in terms of tensor networks that is actually efficient. If you count the number of parameters in all this structure, it may not be obvious at first glance, okay? But uh, but if you sit down and think about how many parameters you need to describe a tensor network, you will realize that it's actually polynomial in the number of sides, okay? So this is an efficient description of a quantum many body system. Okay, it's polynomial in the number of sides. It satisfies the real law for the entanglement entropy, and there are also theorems that tell you that this corresponds to low energy eigenstates of Hamiltonians with local interactions. Okay, now what is what is the trick in being able to represent the states like this? Well, that we actually make entanglement explicit, and we have an extra parameter which is this bond dimension. And as long as this is under control, okay, this is going to be my variational parameter, then everything is fine. Okay. Excellent. Let's move on. Um, you know, something that I've noticed um, by working uh, on tensor networks already for quite a while is that on average, every 10 years, somebody rediscovers tensor networks in a different field. Okay. Um, tensor networks have been applied uh, in many places. Actually, anywhere where you can find uh, a structure of uh, data with correlations, okay, or high dimensional vectors or high dimensional operators. You have tensor networks at work. Okay. One example is quantum states. In quantum states, obviously, we have vectors in high dimensional Hilbert spaces. So we get tensor networks. But this is not the only place where one can actually find tensor networks. I mean, very recently, the people have also understood that when you deal with, uh, let's say, machine learning algorithms, neural networks, convolutional networks, and all these type of things, there you also have high dimensional vectors and high dimensional operators. And it turns out that tensor networks are also at work. There are no Hilbert spaces or quantum systems there, but it's the same mathematical story, okay? So this is a nice uh, slide because uh, every time I give um, a talk about tensor networks, I have to update it. This is just a, a summary of places where tensor networks have made a difference, okay? Obviously, in the strongly correlated systems, as we are talking about today, but in classical statistical mechanics, people have been talking about tensor networks since uh, 68. I mean, if you go to, to the results by Rodney Baxter, okay, on exactly solvable models, you can see that the partition function of many classical statistical models, they are tensor networks already, okay? And actually, Baxter, you know, he started to propose some of the first variational methods on these um, on these type of structures. Also in numerical tensor calculus in mathematics, as I was saying, in artificial intelligence, even in linguistics, in finance, uh, people have been using tensor networks for optimization and other stuff, and also other fields of industry, material sciences. In quantum chemistry, there is a whole community of people doing tensor network uh, methods, okay? Because we can do fermions, and like in Monte Carlo, nuclear physics, they use a lot of DMRZ. In quantum simulations, of course, to validate, um, you know, whether a quantum simulation is, uh, you know, is correct or not, exactly as we are going to be doing in this, in this talk, for quantum information and computation, of course, uh, and then there are also two very interesting trends in high energy physics. One is um, in the study of lattice gauge theories. Lattice gauge theories traditionally have been studied with quantum Monte Carlo. But quantum Monte Carlo has a problem that, uh, you know, it's difficult to do fermions. And that's a big problem because matter is made of fermions, okay? Uh, and it's also difficult to make dynamics, okay? These two things we can do with tensor networks. We can do fermionic systems, we can do dynamics. And now, you know, there are quite a lot of people, I think, that there is a whole community that is emerging in using tensor networks to study, to, to, to study lattice gauge theories. And also in quantum gravity, as I was saying before, there is a connection between this type of tensor network state, uh, the MERA, okay, and the idea CFT and the holographic principle in quantum gravity. I think this is a very cool thing that is going on now in a string, in a string theory. All right. <clears throat> now, what happens if you want to simulate a quantum many body system? Well, that you have uh, a large menu of tensor networks to choose, okay? Uh, you have to choose your fighter, okay? Um, so which sensor network do you choose to simulate a quantum many body system? Well, you know, it depends on the quantum system that you have. I mean, if you have a quantum many body system in 1D, the, probably the first uh, thing that comes to your mind is that, well, correlations are going to be structured, uh, you know, in one direction. And therefore, probably option A here, a matrix product state, is going to be a good option. Okay. If I have a system that is in two dimensions, then I will think, well, you know, maybe I could simulate them with a matrix product state. There are people who do that, that do 2D DMRZ and so on. But that's like forcing it a little bit because, because you know, uh, it's a 2D system, not a 1D system. So if I put a 1D answers, it's not going to capture what is going on. No. So if you want to simulate a 2D system, the first thing that comes to your mind is, well, maybe I should be using option B, okay, which is a, which is a, a projected entangled pair state. 
other options, well, you could choose a three tensor network, for instance, which is also very efficient to manipulate. If you have a critical system in 1D, maybe you want to use a meta, okay, as in option D. And from here, you can just uh, start having very crazy structures. For instance, here in option E, this is something called the branching meta, okay, which is a type of um, entanglement renormalization ansatz that has a volume blow, okay, for the entanglement entropy and allows to study your types of systems. And then you can also, you know, um, represent operators okay you can have matrix product operators you can have peps operators and so on and so you can also represent mixed states you can represent thermal states you can do the dynamics of a noisy system with a limb blood equation and so on and so forth all these things you can do okay with tensor networks and depending on the type of system that you want to simulate you choose the best tensor network available okay <coughs> this is the fighter that we chose to simulate ibm okay we choose a peps a two-dimensional tensor network that adapts to the heavy hexagon lattice of the quantum processor. We put one tensor for every qubit. That's what we do. Which algorithm did we use? Um, well, we used an algorithm that we actually implemented in 2019. It's called uh, GPEPS. GPEPS means uh, graph-based PEPS. This is an evolution of a previous algorithm that uh, we had developed years ago, uh, also with Gifre Vidal, Frank Verstraet, Ignacio Cirac, and so on that is called the infinite PEPS algorithm um, for simulating 2D systems. Uh, GPEPS is a kind of an evolution of that algorithm that is extremely efficient. It's extremely efficient. It's very efficient to update the tensors, okay? Um, because it uses something called the simple tensor update. It's very efficient to compute expectation values because it approximates everything with, with mean field at the time of computing expectation values. There are many approximations here, obviously. Um, it's, but the nice thing about GPEPS is that it's extremely flexible. So just by changing a couple of lines in the code, we can adapt it to any type of lattice, in 2D, in 3D, or in any type of higher dimensions. We've been simulating even with this technique, you know, three-dimensional frustrated quantum antiferromagnets in pyrochlor lattices and so on, which are very complicated structures, and it was relatively simple, okay? Away from criticality, this approach is very, very accurate, actually, because the approximations that we are introducing, they are bad when you have a lot of entanglement. That's exactly close to a quantum critical point. But away from criticality, and as long as entanglement is more or less under control, this technique turns out to be very accurate. Okay. So our first idea was, OK, let's try this. And we'll see how it goes. If we see that we need uh, more accuracy, we'll go for more complex methods. If this works, then it's fine. OK, so this is the first thing that comes to your mind when you want to start simulating a 2D system. And that's what we did. We simulated the IBM experiment. We didn't, we, we, we were not the first ones, OK? We were not the first ones. Actually, here on the left-hand side, you have a list of the people that did it before us. Uh, and I think it's remarkable that the first paper simulating the IBM experiment, it was by uh, by the group of Miles Stoudemire, OK, uh, who is a researcher on tensor networks at the Flatiron Institute in New York. This was two days two days after IBM's paper, OK? So I think IBM's paper was the 13th of June, and a Miles' paper was the 15th, OK? It was two days after IBM posted their paper. Miles had another paper. And they were really fast, OK, in doing this. And in just two days, they had another paper on archive saying, hey, guys, you were too fast, OK? Um, look at this. We can actually simulate it. But after what? After that, there were uh, they simulated it for 127 qubits, OK? After that, there were other papers, OK? Also, the group from Taoshang, which is a very strong group at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, okay, doing a strongly correlated systems, also Garnet Chan, and so on and so forth. Now, we did it using GPEPS, okay, because it's a technique that we control, and it's actually very good because it allows us to scale the thing to higher than to even more qubits. Okay, this is the people that were involved in this work: Siddhartha, Patra, Said Jaromi. Suki, uh, Sukbinder Sikh, and, and myself, uh, myself with classes here. <laughs> okay. And this is the paper that we posted on archive. Okay. That was, uh, no, that was actually exactly September 2023. Okay. Excellent. This is what we simulated. Okay. We considered uh, the three processors. Okay. Not just the Eagle quantum processor, as the previous references have been doing for 127 qubits. We said, okay, let's start with Eagle, but let's see if we can scale it up to more qubits, OK? These are the lattices underlying the three quantum processors that IBM has in mind, OK? Um, Eagle A, 127 qubits. Osprey, 433. This is the one that they released last year, which is here, option B. And the one that they are going to release, I think it's in December that they had the Quantum Summit, uh, is Condor, 100, 1,000, 1, well, 
1,121 qubits is this lattice right here, okay, uh, in figure C, okay? You can uh, believe it or not, here there are, in this figure, there are more than 1,000 qubits, okay, if you start counting the dots. So these are heavy hexagon lattices. All the dots have connectivity either two or three. So it's a 2D lattice, but with very low connectivity, okay, but with very low connectivity. This is a Hamiltonian that we simulated, again, quantumizing model with a transverse field for a spin one half, where we have uh, one spin for every dot on the lattice. We trotterize the time evolution, exactly the same thing that the guys from IBM did, exactly the same, we replicated the same. Um, in the same way, we have this operator, okay, this unitary operator, which is the discretization of the time evolution operator uh, generated by this Hamiltonian right here. Theta H is nothing but a parameter that depends on the strength of the magnetic field, okay? And then the quantum state that we compute is just, you know, many applications of this operator, right, on an initial state, and in particular is with all the qubits or all the spins polarized in the same direction, all right, in the zero direction. So we consider 127, 433, 1,121, and we also went one step beyond because we also did the thermodynamic limit of infinitely many qubits for this system. This is something that we could do with the algorithm. Obviously, you cannot do that. You cannot do infinitely many qubits on a quantum processor, okay? But with uh, tensor networks, you can extrapolate and get numbers for an infinite system, okay? Good. Okay, so these are some of the results that we got. Let's first focus on 127 qubits, okay? The original experiment by IBM. Well, what did we obtain? We obtained exactly, you, I mean, you can make the connection with the first plots that I was showing you. I think it was in the second last slide. This is the same, but with our, <clears throat> but with our numbers, okay? So you can see that comparing with the results from the Eagle processor, okay, with our GPEPS technique, we were able to really, really nail it, okay? And get exactly the correct result, okay? For comparison, we are also, uh, you know, plotting here the results from the other tensor network techniques that IBM was using with MPS, with isometric tensor networks that were not working very well. And this TNS with BP, BP means belief propagation. These are the numbers from, from the paper by Miles Stowe and Meyer, the one that appeared two days after IBM. Okay. So for the average magnetization, you can see that the error that we were obtaining was of 10 to the minus 15. So we really, we really got machine precision in this calculation. Uh, also for the local observables, around 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 10 and so on. So the accuracy was really great, and we were able to reproduce it extremely, extremely well. Also for very non-local observables, okay, as you can see here in the figures down here, we were able really to, to nail it and even got numbers that were actually better than the ones obtained with the quantum processor, okay, for different observables, for, one, for the magnetization of one site in the bulk, and so on. And here in the in the corner here uh, of the of the lower right uh, part, uh, we're actually plotting the convergence with the bond with the inverse bond dimension. Okay, um, as as a reminder, the bond dimension of our tensor network is kind of the variational parameter of our algorithm. If we increase the bond dimension, we increase the precision of the algorithm, but also also the the computational complexity. Okay, so at some point we are gonna when we increase that. At some point, we are going to hit a, a barrier, okay? But this allows us to, you know, increase the precision. So actually, we increased that, and we saw that it was actually converging correctly. And already, for a bond dimension that was relatively small, we got we got results that were very accurate. These were our conclusions for 127 qubits. The GPEP simulated perfectly the system, exactly the same observables that IBM was doing. With an unprecedented low error, we were getting even less error than all the other tensor network techniques that were used before. And something that is astounding, that the simulations were extremely fast. I mean, each point in these plots, it was on an average two seconds on a PC, okay, that was not particularly optimized, running a Python code with, uh, I think, with Windows, okay? So this was actually some, we didn't even care about optimizing anything, and it took two seconds, okay, per point. Now, this is to compare with the quantum processor that took five hours per point. Okay, and it's even worse if you want to compare it to the results, let's say, with matrix protest states that I think they say on the paper that they took them uh, more than 10 hours per point. Okay, so they were obviously not doing it correctly. The results were holding for local and local observables, and this was, this was the first indication that, okay, the method works and we are going in the right direction. Once we got this, we said, okay, what else can we do? Well, we do, we can do, oops, where is it? Here, we can do larger systems, okay? 
I mean, 127 qubits is okay, but can we simulate the, the model also for 433 and for 1,000 qubits and, and need a thermodynamic limit? And that's exactly what we did. And, and, uh, and the answer is yes, we can do it, okay? Here you can see the average magnetization. This is the um, expectation value of an observable on 10 sites. This is what it means weight 10. And this is an observable on 17 sites. That's what it means weight 17. And you can see that actually we got convergence and the error was always extremely low as we increase the size of the system. Okay, here the one I mentioned we were using was around 32. But our conclusion that does was that yes, we are also getting very large accuracy for this for this type of simulation. Okay. Up to 1,121 qubits and even for the thermodynamic limit. Okay. And the simulations were also always extremely efficient. I mean, it was not two seconds, but it was within the range of 10. 10 seconds at most. Okay. That was not that was not that was not a big deal. Then we said, okay, what else can we do? Because this looks like it's working. Well, we can do longer time evolutions. Okay. The simulations by IBM stop at five trotter steps. All right. Um every trotter step had these four layers of unitary gates, one qubit and three uh, layers of two qubit gates on, on different types of links. It was five times the repetition of this. This is a very long time evolution for a quantum computer, okay? But we said, okay, how long can we go with tensor networks? And well, we went, for instance, for 127 qubits, we went up to 39 trotter steps, and it was still converging, okay? With a bond dimension up to 560, starts to be large, but it was still converged. For 433 qubits, up to 30, 38 trotter steps and bond dimension up to 370, also converging. We didn't see that it was uh, going off, okay, for the observables. And for one more than 1,000 qubits, up to 37, okay, trotter steps. And it was still converging with a bond dimension around 270. The plots here on the upper side are for um, the magnetization of a site in the bulk, okay, in the middle of the of the heavy hexagon lattice. The ones below are for the average magnetization over all the sites. And what, what, what we saw is that actually when you increase the bond dimension for very long time evolutions, it was still converging. We wanted to test this because uh, a hard regime for uh, tensor networks is when you start generating a lot of entanglement. And this happens precisely when time evolutions are very long. Okay, then we said, okay, how long does it need to be until we start to see that we have a lot of entanglement that we cannot capture with the best available computational resources that we have? And actually, you know, we went up to 39 trotter steps and it was still converging. Okay, we actually saturated um, the, the resources that we had available. This was running on the cluster that we have locally here at the, at the DIPC. Okay, it was still working. These simulations were not on a PC. Okay, these were on a cluster. But that was still working, okay. Uh, the simulations were still really fast and the accuracy was still perfect. So we could still simulate this, the system, okay, for time evolutions that saturated the memory of the computer cluster that we were using and still we saw convergence, okay. So that was a very good indication that it looks like entanglement in this system was not particularly large. And that's the reason why we were able to simulate it. Okay, so... These are kind of my conclusions. Um, what does it imply, everything that I've uh, been explaining here? Okay, well, the first thing is that obviously we simulated the original IBM experiment, okay, for 127 qubits. Um, we simulated for 10 times more qubits or even more, even the thermodynamic limit, and eight times longer time evolutions, okay? And I really think that we could even push it forward, okay? We really didn't take a lot of time in optimizing, in optimizing the code. Now, the conclusion, I think is that, you know, the original experiment by IBM is fine. I mean, I don't have anything against that. I, I also told them, okay, I really like what you did, okay? For error mitigation is amazing, okay? This, it's a great, uh, you know, advancement in, in, in quantum computing, okay? This is, nobody had done that, okay? But you cannot claim that you are doing better or that you are entering into, a, into an era where, you know, um, tensor network methods struggle to compute this. But as you can see, we can do it in two seconds, okay? The problem was that you somehow chose the wrong, you chose the wrong, the wrong fighter, okay? You were choosing a technique that was not adapted to your lattice, okay? So, so you know, you just have to know how tensor networks work to really realize that uh, actually you can actually simulate this system. Okay, and as I said, we were not the first ones. Okay, there were a bunch of papers actually before us, not for so many qubits. They were focusing 127, but people also realized that. Okay, why is this the case? Why can't we simulate this system with tensor networks? Well, you know, 
I think this is a good reason. The Hamiltonian that they chose is too tailored to the actual quantum processor, okay? To the topology of interactions in the quantum circuit. There is a good reason why they chose this Hamiltonian. Obviously, it's easy to also to do the quantum the quantum simulation, okay? Because you have nearest neighbor interactions and you don't have to care about swap gates and so on. That's perfect, okay? But precisely the fact that you are attaching so much the Hamiltonian to the lattice, I think that's one of the reasons why we can actually simulate it, okay? Because we can simulate once you have a lattice and you have nearest neighbor interactions with tens or or even you know short range interactions with tensor networks, you can actually go there and and smash the thing, okay? Also, why why so little entanglement? This is also surprising for us. I mean, I was very surprised to see that even for very long time evolutions, we also got convergence. Uh, I wanted to see at which point my tensor network simulations were not working so that I could go to IBM, to Zeig and Bennett and so on and tell them, look, you have to do a simulation for 100 qubits and so many trotter steps and up to here, this is the best I can do, okay? Everything that goes beyond, you know, this is going to be your benchmark. But I couldn't tell him because he was still converging, okay? And my feeling is that the problem here is the lattice, okay? We are working with a heavy hexagon lattice. And as I was saying before, all the nodes in the heavy hexagon lattice have connectivity two or three. Connectivity two is a 1D system, okay? Connectivity three is almost like a tree. So, so this is the closest 2D lattice to a 1D lattice, okay? Um, in some type of uh, measurement of how... What is what is you know how two D are the correlations on a lattice? Probably this this is one of the less of the easiest to simulate, okay? Because the connectivity is is very low. It's actually extremely close to a tree. Just by cutting a few links on this lattice, you get actually a tree with no loops, okay? If you try to do the same thing on a square lattice, you have to cut more links. But on this lattice, it's actually very easy. And I think that this is the reason why we can simulate this lattice extremely efficiently. And it has, even if it's 2D, it has very little entanglement at the end of the day. Okay. Now we can go a little bit more philosophical. Um, and uh, as I am saying here, oh, I'm sorry that I was uh, raising my hand. So uh, let me move it down. Okay. This is automatic. I don't know uh, why I was doing that. Um, the question is that where, you know, this is this is something a bit more fundamental, you know. Um, can lattice-based quantum computers reach the level of noise so that they cannot be simulated by tensor networks? That's that's a question that, from my point of view, I don't think it's correctly answered, okay? You know, every time we have um, quantum computers with artificial qubits, we have to put them on a lattice. And this lattice has a topology of interactions, and obviously it cannot be too complicated because it's going to be experimentally hard. But if we do it too easy, then you can see we can simulate it. Okay, where is the limit? Where is the limit of this? Okay, and can we reduce the noise in such a way that at some point, even if it's on an artificial lattice, we cannot simulate it with tensor networks? We don't know. We, we haven't seen an example yet. Okay, uh, even for the examples of quantum advantage by Google and so on, they were simulated with tensor networks at some point. Also, so so this is an open question. Okay, whether lattice-based quantum computers, which are the ones based on artificial qubits, at some point can have a very low level of noise, so that they cannot be simulated by a tensor network. This is a question that, from my point of view, is is open. Okay, I mean, after all, my conclusion also here is that the lattice is a huge constraint. The reason why we were able to simulate this is because somebody placed it on an artificial lattice, and this lattice was easy, so that they could build the quantum processor, but that also made the quantum simulation, the tensor network simulation very easy, okay? So, so why imposing a lattice at all, okay? I mean, maybe we should go for quantum processors that don't have any lattice at all, okay? Lattice-free quantum processors where we just have a bunch of qubits and we make them interact whenever the interaction is necessary and let it evolve, okay? This is, for instance, what happens with ion traps, you know, with neutral atoms, that everybody's interacting with everybody. And probably one should also think about this type of schemes also with superconducting qubits and maybe also with, with quantum dots, okay? And that's it. Well, this is everything that I wanted to explain to you. Um, I think there is a lot of uh, research that can still be, be done um, starting from here. For the record, and uh, since we are talking about this and I'm talking a lot about uh, IBM, I also talked to them, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because they obviously noticed about these results. I talked in person with Jay Gambetta, uh, which is the IBM Chief Quantum Sciences, the guy that is actually building the quantum computer and we were discussing all this. And and uh, so, until now, we still didn't kill ourselves, okay? Uh, we actually have a very good relation 
and they are very interested in, in continuing with this. Okay, excellent. So that was everything. And um, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we have time for questions. Please press your hand or open your mic. So Jan, you can open your mic. Yes, yes I, I have a question. Can you go back to the, your previous slide, please? Yeah. Yes, OK. So here you mentioned that the big constraint is the, the lattice, right? So. Can you think of a structure of a of a lattice where a tensor network wouldn't be able to simulate like what kind of interactions we need the lattice to have, <laughs> or, or is is something that just cannot happen? I I don't know. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a, I mean, the more connectivity the lattice, the harder it is to simulate in principle. Um, because uh, but on the other hand, uh, I've also seen tricks and techniques to simulate lattices with very high connectivity. Okay. Uh, in terms of Hamiltonians, I would say that if you allow for Hamiltonians with long range interactions, those are harder to simulate. Yeah. I mean, nearest neighbor interactions are very easy to implement for the quantum computer and for, and for tensor networks. But if you allow long range interactions in nearest neighbors, next to nearest neighbors, next to next to nearest neighbors, or even longer, okay, those are harder. Okay. Obviously, they are harder because they create more entanglement. Okay. And that's more difficult. The quantum state is more difficult to capture with an with a tensor network. That would have been much more difficult to simulate, but also much more difficult to implement on the quantum computer. Because if you have long range interactions, if you have an interaction, a two body gate between a qubit here and another one on the other side of the lattice, you have to start doing swaps. Okay, and you accumulate error and so on. So it just makes the simulation more difficult for both for both techniques. But uh, but the limit should go in that direction. And I have another question if I, if I can ask it. Um, basically, the, the papers that were um, published before yours, they had worse results than yours, like with less accuracy, because they mm -hmm. didn't um, catch the symmetry of the lattice, such as GPS. Is that the yeah. conclusion? Yes. And they also, they also, um, they, they, they were also only for 127 qubits. Okay. Um, you know, it's true that 2D systems are hard to simulate even with PEPs, okay? Uh, but there are many tricks in tensor networks that we can implement to make the algorithms a little bit more efficient, okay? And, and I think that GPEPs actually uh, has many of them already incorporated. This is something that the previous references didn't do. They do more complex updates, that they are more accurate and so on, but they are also computationally more expensive. And at the end of the day, you know, with 100 qubits, it was already a difficult simulation, okay? In our case, we simplified many things, and that was the thing that actually allowed us to scale to, to more than 1,000 qubits, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, now, uh, Mariano, I think. Yes. Uh, no, no, Mika. Oh, yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yep. so my, my question is, so, in a bit the, the idea I got from this uh, is this like a competition between uh, these people claiming this quantum advantage and then this tensor network community uh, telling that they don't have this advantage because this can be classically solvable by tensor networks. So my idea is a bit you mentioned a bit in your conclusion, but which is the room exactly for quantum computing, or is it like a way of combining tensor networks and uh, until leaving a problem in a way in a in a, in a form in such a, a there is quantum advantage. So where is exactly the, the space for this one of the tensor network community and, and people doing quantum computers? Yeah, I think I think I think this this competition, as you said, um it, it makes it makes life more interesting. <laughs> okay. Uh you know, I think this is necessary. So so quantum advantage is 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 something very you know, I also work on quantum computing, okay? So so quantum advantage is is uh, is a concept that is is very hard to achieve. It's very hard to achieve because because it's a moving target. Okay, you can improve a lot your quantum methods. Okay, and obviously you have to do it. But as long as you improve your quantum algorithms, then the, the classical algorithms also also it's a challenge for them, as just happened here. And they, then they also improve. Okay, and then you have to move forward and so on. So there is this thing going on, 
And I think that this is a very healthy, this is a very healthy thing. It's exactly what needs to happen. Okay. In order to, at the end of the day, what we want is a quantum computer with 1 million qubits, error corrected, and that is able to compute everything. Okay. But to get there, okay, we need, we need motivation. And I think that the tensor networks are actually triggering, <laughs> triggering that motivation for the, for the quantum computing community. No, um, I think there is room. Obviously there is room. We know that tensor networks at some point are going to fail. Okay. If there is too much entanglement, we cannot simulate it. Okay. That's it. Um, and then we need a quantum computer. The quantum computer can simulate it even if it has a lot of entanglement. Okay. So, so in principle, okay, uh, there is room for both for both approaches, and there is even room, uh, and this is something that we are also exploring uh, in different projects for hybrid algorithms. Okay. I mean, um, you can take the best of of the two approximations. Okay, and, and you can build up, especially now that we have uh, quantum computers that are noisy, that are you know imperfect, and so on, that are not error corrected. This type of these devices, um, you know, we can, they are imperfect, but if we combine them with classical techniques that are already good, okay, this combination of hybrid algorithms, it can be, I think it's going to be the first uh, wave of, of important developments in quantum computing that uh, that we are going to have. Actually, we're already developing some some of this. So so it's not that the two techniques are incompatible. I think that they, they, they have to live with each other. Okay, and uh, and we can use tensor networks to improve quantum algorithms and also the other way around. So that's that's not a problem. Thank you. Now, Manuel, you can open your mic. Yes, thank you. So I was wondering, uh, in a very related way, um, where you think that other classical algorithms have their niche, right? Because obviously, um, the 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 simple way to answer this would be, oh, I mean, I have it on the slide, right? But wherever tensor networks are very um, like pathologically fail, like right with the same niche that quantum computers could fill is where also other classical methods could fill. But like more realistically, what are the, like and practically, what are kind of some niches where tensor networks might not be optimal, right? Yeah. They, they might still work, right? But like they might not be optimal and other classical methods could fill in. Yeah. For example, others that have also simulated IBM. Yeah. Sampling. Sampling is a good example of this. Uh, so, you know, the claims on quantum advantage by Google, they were about uh, sampling random unitaries, okay? Those are hard to simulate for tensor networks, okay? Those are hard to simulate. I mean, th there was this simulation uh, by a Chinese group using tensor network of the first claim on quantum advantage, but I think the second claim, which is for a larger system, that's a still that's a still complicated to simulate. So doing random sampling with tensor networks, that, that's hard, Okay. Uh, because there is a lot of entanglement involved and so on. That's a good example of a niche of, of type of, of things that, that are hard to do with a tensor network. And then obviously also systems that uh, involve a lot of entanglement in, in, the, in the quantum state. So for instance, if you go to the dynamics, uh, long time dynamics of, uh, let's say, uh, fermionic Hubbard models with um, long range interactions, poof. That has a lot of entanglement okay and, and i mean that's that's going to be a very hard simulation okay so but probably you can approximate it with other types of techniques i don't know a dynamic amine field theory and so on and so forth like these people in superconductivity do but but still there are going to be regimes where you cannot approximate it with any classical method and then you need a quantum computer okay yeah thanks thank you so uh, we have also one question on the chat is uh, can we sample the ground state of the Hamiltonian using tensor network? Can we sample the ground state of the Hamiltonian using tensor network? Sample, you mean by com to compute the ground state? Uh, yes, yes. For this particular system, yes. Yeah. Actually, the Ising model on a transverse field, um, we've been doing that uh, for 2D systems. We've been doing that uh, with tensor network since, pff, I don't know, many years, almost 20 years ago or more. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. One can compute the ground state. For this system, okay, for this system. And I guess following up the, the question in the chat, is there um, a general method to calculate ground states with uh, tensor networks or like, uh, I don't know, some key pairs or something you mentioned? Yes, there are, there are different, there are, there are different ways. Um, I mean, there are approximations that are called variational algorithms where you just, you know, you compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, okay? But now the quantum state is the tensor network, uh, and you, you know, 
following the variational principle, you try to minimize this expectation value variationally. And your variational parameters are, are the coefficients in the tensors, OK? Uh, this is a type of tensor network algorithm that is called variational, OK? Uh, and the density matrix and normalization group fits exactly into this class for, for matrix plot states. But you can reproduce the same strategy also for, for 2D or higher dimensions. And these are called variational algorithms. Um, you can also do imaginary time evolution. Okay, so if you have a Hamiltonian, instead of doing evolution in real time, uh, which has uh, the imaginary unit, if you remove the imaginary unit, you have an evolution in imaginary time. And it turns out that this is an, if you let that evolve, that's no longer a unitary operator, but the long time evolution is taking you to actually the quantum state with the lowest uh, eigenvalue. Okay. Uh, it's an attractor, okay? And this is uh, this is called imaginary time evolution, and it's also a method to compute ground states with tensor networks. We've been doing that in 1D, in 2D, and so on. And then there are other methods that are more mathematical, but they are also very beautiful that are based on on tangent on on differential geometry and tangent spaces. Okay, they 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 characterize the manifold of tensor network states with a given geometry, okay? And inside of this manifold, they look for what is the shortest path to actually the ground state, okay? These have been methods that were developed a few years ago, and they are also they are also extremely efficient. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Roman, I don't know if you hear me. Yeah. Uh, I'm Javier, <laughs> hello. Uh, because I, I couldn't see how to raise my hand. I mean, I'm a little bit... Uh... <laughs> But uh, I wanted to ask you, I mean, this peak icing model, uh, so it seems like the, the, what you, you, you are looking for a model that, that has a strong entanglement growth to, to, to benchmark your, yeah? yeah. So, but this, 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 I think, model, this kick icing model, you can go to peculiar points where you, you can find um, maximal chaos. Uh, for example, if you go to the self dual, EKP model, this platinic cost process model. No, it's just it's a it's a line. You have the 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 kick, the two kicks, and then the there's a self dual point, and you have a linear growth with time of entanglement. Have you mm -hmm. checked that? That's a good point. No, we didn't. We didn't check that. And we this didn't. is uh, one of these self dual um, yeah. sort of unitary models. I mean, you can solve mm -hmm. them exactly in the in the large end limit. Yeah, and then that's a that's a that's a good point. Yeah. 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 That would be interesting to test. Yeah. yeah, we saw that there were some some interesting things going on in the dynamics. Maybe maybe this is what you what you mean, but we didn't we didn't explore uh -huh. it further. No. Uh -huh. There are peculiar points where you have maximum yes. scram. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, is there any other questions? Please raise your hand or open your mic. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll clap my hands. <laughs> Thank you. So, see you. Please. See you soon. Goodbye. And uh, now, is there any other? If there is not any other question, we will just. Please. Ah, sorry. I thought it was already done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roman, for your. Excellent. Time. Thank you. See you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you.